Am I audible, I guess, uh, to everyone? Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a delight to have uh, the group here, and I want to thank ITF for, for uh, working with us to, to host it. We're pleased to uh, have this group, and I think it's been very informative to me in researching this white paper and in uh, reading the others that have been prepared for this event and so far in our discussion. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, Lusardo Bolaños and Nobuhiko Daito, who are here. Uh, who worked with me on this paper over the last several months and uh, will answer all the difficult questions that come up and easy ones I will be happy to, uh, to, to take. A brief overview of my outline uh, just on the matter of definitions and to Professor Gwash's point just now, I think some uh, comments on how we've defined that may be different and, and so we should be aware of that as we go through the discussion. Uh, theoretical perspectives, which we've already talked about, I'll just touch on those. A little bit about the U.S. market overview, what's happening here, and then highway P3s and renegotiations in the U.S., and the bulk of my time on the six case studies that are outlined in the white paper, and uh, I'll give brief thumbnails on each of those, discuss, and conclude. So to uh, go ahead, uh, we are defining P3 renegotiations as modifications to contractual agreements, but adapting this to the U.S. market by looking at complete buyouts and bankruptcy filings. Uh, I should also say that in the data presented in the white paper that refinancings or restructuring of finance on the private side is counted in a couple of our cases and that would probably fall outside of the definition of, of Professor Gouache. So we can recalculate those numbers as we go forward or if it comes up in the discussion. Uh, the concern uh, that we are responding to in addition to the interest by ITF is uh, the one that's been mentioned already which is the, the, is, is the air opportunism uh, that is costing the public purse uh, money, money? And I think that's, uh, that's really a core question why we look at this. We don't have a clear test to evaluate motives, and we'll come back to that as a methodological challenge in attributing motives to parties in these, uh, in these discussions. Um, part of the theoretical background uh, is this issue of, of, uh, of uh, opportunism and whether that is active on the public side or on the private side or both. Uh, do we have collusion uh, between the public and private has been suggested already in our discussions. Um, or are companies that are experienced renegotiators having an advantage in, uh, in winning contracts rather than those who are most experienced at designing, building, constructing, or uh, operating and maintaining uh, facilities. A second consideration is whether it comes about as a, re renegotiations come about as a result of external conditions, and I think we've talked about those already. A third possible explanation, are they an inevitable result of complex projects? P3s, especially in the U.S. market, uh, are often applied to more complex projects, which have greater uncertainty associated with them, and that uncertainty could be seen as a trigger for renegotiations. And finally, are they occurring because of winner's curse issues that we've already mentioned earlier uh, with the, the highest bidder in, in the case of a brownfield or the lowest bidder in the case of a greenfield project uh, then more likely to come back and ask for renegotiated terms. The, um, the okay, so to speak briefly about the U.S. market, uh, as everybody probably knows, the U.S. market has 50 states, a federal district, a couple of territories, and assets typically are owned by the states, in some cases by localities. And so uh, the statutory environment, the court and judicial environment are very much centered at the state level rather than at the federal level, although there are important, a couple of important federal policies that have a big impact in P3s, including TIFIA, which is a subordinated uh, credit enhancement mechanism that's available from the federal government, and also the tax deductibility of municipal bonds, which gives them a fav more favorable cost of capital. Uh, so 33 states and Puerto Rico have enabling legislation for P3s, but as we'll see, most of the action is in California, Texas, Florida, and Virginia, where we are today. Uh, this chart, the top line, shows the number of deals over the period 88 to, to 13. So 
It shows a rise in the 90s of uh, deal flow, and this is not dollars, this is deal counts. So it's a, you know, it, it, it is what it is. Uh, we can see the green line uh, below is the number of transportation deals which have been slowly but not, and not quite steadily increasing, but the secular trend is clearly positive. The distribution of deals, that's not very legible. I apologize. The, the, the red on the upper uh, right there is property. Uh, th those are uh, or buildings, and, and that is some of the, uh, the activity. The remainder is split pretty much between water, various types of water projects and various types of transportation projects. Again, this is number of deals, not uh, dollar value of deals. This shows the distribution of highway P3s by state in the U.S. You can see California 4, Texas 10, Florida 13, Virginia 6. That's the bulk of the action in, uh, in the U.S. And the renegotiations, and here's where the definition that was uh, mentioned by Professor Guash might come in. The 5 in Virginia includes some uh, changes on the private side that might not be counted under your definition of, of a renegotiation, but only one renegotiation in Florida, four in Texas, two in California, and we'll be talking about some of these. Again, using this definition of uh, P3 renegotiations, this shows over the last 20 years the number of highway P3 deals going up to about 45, and the number of renegotiations at about 18. That's at least one renegotiation. Uh, and in some cases, we have multiple renegotiations, but they'd only occur, they'd only show one time in on the red, uh, on the red line there. So I'll talk next about our case studies. They're listed on the left there, two in California, one in Indiana, and three in Virginia. You can see the distribution of uh, P3, highway P3s in the table and how our uh, selected cases stack up. So it's not a random uh, selection by any means, but we did try to get a range of, of, uh, of projects. I'm going to step through these rather quickly and happy to expand on them in the, the discussion period. Uh, the first one was one of the first uh, P3s, highway P3s in the U.S., the State Route 91 in the Los Angeles uh, metro area. It was a 10-mile facility built in the center of an existing highway with variable uh, toll lanes that were reversible depending on the commute direction. It was financially closed in 93, opened for service in 95. The uh, no particular challenging uh, structures or, uh, you know, in terms of tunnels or bridges. That's, there we are. Uh, there was a provision in the original contract that, uh, a non-compete provision, that said the state of California, or Orange County, was not able to build any competing facility without the consent of the concessionaire. Uh, in fact, the state attempted to breach that provision and build a competing facility. The concessionaire went to court, prevented them from doing that, and so the state found it couldn't, um, uh, wasn't willing to honor that provision, and so they bought the concessionaire out uh, in order to, to work, around, work around that, uh, that uh, provision. So that's all I'll say about 91. I'm happy to come back to that in our later discussion. Second project, also in California, this one to the south, between the city of San Diego and the Mexican border, the South Bay Expressway, a 13-mile highway. Uh, it was authorized in 1990 under the same law that authorized the first case we looked at. This one took much longer to reach financial close. In 2003, uh, the original concessionaires were bought out by Macquarie prior to financial close. The facility opened um, inauspiciously in November of 2007, right before the onset of the financial crisis. And, um, and uh, in one of the provisions that it, in, or one of the features of the of the roadway was a, a very complex bridge project that had to be built uh, from above, essentially, in order to protect uh, the wetlands that were below it. The uh, SPV filed for bankruptcy in 2010, exited in 2011. Macquarie's equity was written to zero, and the, the lenders took over the project, including USDOT, which had $140 million 
dollars stake in the project when it, uh, when it was uh, financially closed in 2003. Uh, that had accumulated <laughs> $32 million in capitalized interest. After bankruptcy, uh, there was a $6 million, I'll focus on the federal interest in particular, uh, $6 million equity payment, a $93 million debt, and then 32% ownership of the property going forward. So we see here if the federal funding has taken a haircut. Uh, they've exchanged a loan for an equity stake. Um, this project was purchased by the San Diego Association of Governments, which is a regional government operating in the San Diego area. The <coughs> tolls were reduced and it continues to operate. Third project is the Indiana Toll Road, which has been very much in the news in the U.S. in the last few months because it declared bankruptcy last, I think, on September 20th or something like that of, of last month. So this was a headline project in 2006, $3.8 billion payment to the state of Indiana to take over an existing 150-mile toll road. Uh, there was an agreement to build uh, some additional new lane mileage on the facility, but a cash payment to the, to the state. Uh, it was uh, one of the first two deals in the U.S. that I think really got the attention of many states around, uh, around the country as to the potential value that might be locked up in their infrastructure. This project encountered some, uh, you know, well, it just declared bankruptcy, as I mentioned. They did have several changes that are listed there. Um, the, the bankruptcy last month uh, is said to be a quick turn bankruptcy. It will go into bankruptcy court, or it went into bankruptcy in September. The expectation is it would emerge from bankruptcy in, uh, within a year. The lenders would receive about 98 cents on the dollar for their loan value, but the equity of Macquarie was, uh, and was extinguished on that project in, in the bankruptcy. Uh, the next case study is a, a ver first of three projects here in Virginia. This one just west of Dulles Airport, which many of you may have traveled into uh, when you were, were flying into Washington, goes a 14-mile roadway uh, authorized under a 1988 law that was passed in Virginia to allow the building of a private toll road. Uh, it, uh, 14 miles in length, it opened in uh, 1995 after financial close in 1993. Uh, and immediately ran into some financial problems. The owners defaulted on debt in 95. Tolls were increased and speed limit was increased in 97. The debt was restructured in 99. The concession period was extended in 2001. Uh, and then uh, tolls were adjusted. Macquarie acquired the project in 2005. And the toll setting mechanism last year was modified to that one that's shown, uh, shown here. The next project is in the state capital, Richmond, Virginia, it's called the Pocahontas Parkway. It was a short uh, nine-mile facility that included a high-level bridge over the James River, which is a navigable waterway, uh, which required it to have a very high, uh, high uh, ship clearance. It was the first project to be undertaken under the 1995 Virginia uh, Public-Private Transportation Act. Uh, and financial close in 98, open to uh, service in 2002. The uh, Transurban, the Australian, uh, Transurban USA, the Australian subsidiary, bought it in 2006, uh, and the concession period was extended to 99 years. Uh, in 2012, Transurban wrote off its equity uh, to zero but continued operation, and earlier this year, Transurban transferred operation to a new service provider and at the same time uh, paid off the TIFIA debt, I think was 150, uh, 150 million of TIFIA debt was, was paid off in that 2000, earlier, earlier this year in that deal. And the last uh, case study is a current project uh, by Skanska and Macquarie in Hampton Roads, which is a 
strategically important shipping and military port on the East Coast, natural deep water port, very substantial uh, natural endowments as a port. It's a, it's a very a strong port. The uh, project was closed in 2002 and the facility is expected to open in 2017. It's a 2.2 mile facility, but it includes a tunnel, a two-lane tunnel and a, 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 a bridge viaduct project. The part of the challenge of this was it duplicates or it, it, it will expand the capacity across the Elizabeth River. There's an existing two-lane tunnel that was built in the 1960s and uh, t under tolls, the tolls were repaid or the bonds were paid off, the tolls were eliminated uh, and this, it's a huge bottleneck in that region and the new project will build a new two-lane tunnel that's parallel to the existing two-lane tunnel, renovate and bring to uh, modern design standards the existing tunnel. The, one of the challenges or special features of this was that the financing involved imposing a toll early on before the new facility was opened and that caused quite a lot of political controversy uh, and so the renegotiations that occurred there both uh, precipitated by the state, the first in 2012 to delay the onset of tolls until February of 2014, earlier this year, and then the second in January of 2014 to ramp up the tolls gradually rather than starting out at the originally agreed upon toll. I think the current, the, the, the ultimate toll will be a dollar and eighty-four cents and the delayed toll I believe was one one dollar and twenty-five cents. So th those are the case studies and as I say I'll be happy to come back and expand on them in the discussion period. Uh, looking for evidence of opportunism, uh, there's a couple of things that came out as we looked at these cases. You might say that California's behavior to try to breach the contract was an example of opportunism to breach the non-compete agreement. That was not successful and they had to, they had to buy out the concession. On the South Bay project, there haven't been findings of fact on this, but there was strong opposition. There is strong opposition by the California professional engineers, the professional engineers in California government, which is the union of state professional engineers. They have great concerns about P3s and privatization and had opposed uh, legislation to allow P3s and its continuation and continue to oppose that. There are allegations by the concessionaire that the professional engineers delayed the, you know, slow walked the environmental permitting process and in this case the environmental permitting delay was on the concessionaire rather than on the state. Uh, that was, those have been dismissed and not, not accepted in bankruptcy. And uh, here in Virginia, uh, we've had a lot of uh, political uh, changes in party in, in the state senate and in the governor over the last 20 years. And there, you know, those changes of party and changes of control are also uh, a possible, uh, you know, reflect, may, may uh, provide an opportunity for for government to change the terms of a deal that was struck by a prior governor. On the private side, all the concessionaires, not surprisingly, have experience with uh, renegotiations, but we don't really have any direct evidence of opportunism and need more analysis to say, uh, to draw stronger conclusions there. The issue of exogenous changes was very important in almost every case. Uh, the economic growth and unemployment affected Dulles Greenway, South Bay Expressway, Pocahontas Parkway, partially the Indiana Toll Road. The uh, South Bay Expressway also may have been uh, affected by commodity prices and interest rates played an important role in uh, Dulles Greenway and especially in Indiana Toll Road. Uh, in Indiana Toll Road there was a step up swap, interest swap agreement that stepped up the obligations on interest payments over the beginning from 2006 uh, for the following 10 years and as interest rates plummeted, the cost of buying out that swap agreement exploded and that was part of the difficulty uh, that they encountered in that project. In terms of contract complexity, there is certainly 
evidence that m many of these were highly complex uh, projects in South Bay. Uh, I mentioned the bridge project that, that after environmental approval was required to use a very sophisticated and expensive uh, construction techniques to minimize the ground level impacts of the construction. The P3 model is new in the U.S. market and in four of the cases that we looked at it was the first time that the, the law had been used in SR91. It was the first time SB480 had been used. Uh, South Bay was another project that came out of that same bill. Indiana Toll Road was a new P3 uh, for Indiana. Dulles Greenway using the 1988 bill in, in, uh, in Virginia and Pocahontas Parkway using the 1995 law in Virginia. Uh, the political viability of a lot of the projects that we looked at did require complex arrangements for fiscal uh, tolling, environmental, um, civil rights concerns were an issue in the, in the South Bay Expressway or in the, uh, in the Elizabeth River case because the tunnel, the new tunnel that was constructed and the existing tunnel connected a primarily African American community with a large number of jobs at the other end of the tunnel. And many of the projects had complex, you know, technical features, duration, and so forth. And finally, Winner's Curse seems to have been uh, an explanation for the Indiana Toll Road case. There were four bidders in that, in that case. Sintra Macquarie bid was a billion dollars more than the next highest uh, bid. So it was, uh, it was a very surprising number when it was awarded and uh, when the bids were were opened and that may have come back then to haunt that uh, project. So to wrap up, uh, let me just say that, that you know, the factors associated with renegotiations in this market, certainly external shocks have played an important part in all of these projects uh, or many of these projects. Contract complexity also a feature. The political environment, concerns about private provision of public goods, uh, fraction, you know, sort of the, the, the ethnic divisions in some of the communities that are being serviced, also an issue, uh, and complex projects. We didn't see definitive effort, evidence of opportunism in the cases that we looked at. Winner's Curse I've mentioned, uh, and I should say that the government losses to date uh, are certainly, you know, they're certainly real, South Bay uh, Expressway appears like it may bring losses to TIFIA, although uh, TIFIA claims that they will be able to get all their money out of that project through their equity stake in the project, but having an equity stake as opposed to a loan is a much different, uh, a much different uh, agreement. We had extensions of terms in, in Dulles Greenway, uh, and as any researcher's presentation will conclude, more research is needed uh, to, to uh, look further at these issues. So I'll um, wrap up there and look forward to the questions as we go forward. So thank you very much.